What's up, everybody? Welcome. It is great to be together today. I want to say if it's your first time watching or first time with us, we're so happy that you're here. Hope you enjoy today. Hope, most of all, that you encounter God today. And uh, I want to say welcome to our studio audience. It's just great to be together. And we're going to jump into the message today. We're right in the middle of what we call our faith collection, a collection of sermons around this topic of faith. And uh, this year, every collection that we have is under the theme of foundations. We're talking about the things that are foundational to what we believe. Why do we believe what we believe? What do we believe? Why do we believe it? And how do we apply it to our lives? And as Christians, we want to have a firm foundation. And so as we're talking about faith, faith is a big deal. We live by faith, not by sight. And so um, we're going to start with Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, as we've started with every week during our collection. Um, and then we're going to jump into our specific topic today. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to put it on the screen as well. But before we read, let's just pray and ask God to speak to us. God, we open your word today with reverence. We open your word today with humility. And we open your word today with an expectation that you're going to speak to us, God. So here we are. We're listening. We're, we're ready to receive from you. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. It shows us where to go, how to think, what to do. And so we're expectant today to hear from you in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen, amen. Are you ready? Let's go. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for the writer of Hebrews says. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. And by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. This is, our, this is our collection. This is our topic, faith. It's bringing evidence and substance to what we believe and what we hope for but cannot see. And as we bring evidence and substance through our actions, through our hands and our feet and our words, the church being the church, doing the things that God's called us to do, as we do that, we bring into reality what otherwise is not a reality. We bring into what we can see and feel and, and, and touch, we bring into reality what otherwise could not be seen. The church in action is God visible in the world. And so when we live by faith, God or the world sees God in us. Now, not only is it impossible to please God without faith, but it's impossible to be saved without faith. This is how faith is how we're saved. Faith is what, what gives us right standing with God. And, the, and, and Paul says to the Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, he says, it's by grace you've been saved. Like, you, we, we're saved by grace, meaning we don't deserve it. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. God has, by grace, saved us. But, it, but Paul says, but it's through faith. And so here's the picture, and this is important for our topic today that we're going to get to. We're saved by the grace of God. It's not because of works. It's by, by the grace of God. But that grace is activated through this faith that we're talking about. And so the grace of God comes. It's unlocked. It's activated, however you want to say it, because of our faith in him. Not because of what we do, but it's because of our faith. So Paul paints this picture. It's by grace that we've been saved, activated through faith. It's not by our own doing. It's a gift of God but we receive that gift through faith. All right, so you're with me so far. But then Paul says to the Colossians, as you received Christ, you must continue or walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. He tells the Colossians, the same way that you receive the gift of God is the same way you continue in the gift of God. Well, how did we receive it? We received it by grace through faith. So how do we live every day as Christians? By grace through faith. Um, we live, we don't, we're not just saved by the grace of God. We live every day in the grace of God, covered in the grace of God, held by the grace of God, uh, washed clean by the grace of God. And that's continual. And so is our faith. 
is continual. So God's pouring out his grace. We're giving God our faith. And that is a continual, that we, we live that until the day that we meet Jesus face to face. The same way we came is the same way we continue. The same way we received Christ, we walk in Christ. Uh, Paul also says that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. This is like, I'm saved, but I work out my salvation. I've, I've been forgiven, but, but I live out of that forgiveness. And so it's a one-time thing, but it's also a continual thing. Are you following me? And he says we live that out with fear and trepidation. We work, we work our faith out with, with fear and trembling. And, and I love that because he's, he's not talking about being scared of God. He's talking about having a holy reverence and a holy awe for God and an understanding, an awareness of our brokenness and how much trouble we are in without him. So it's not getting cocky. It's not getting arrogant. It's not getting prideful. It's realizing not only was I saved by humbly coming before God, but I continue in God humbly every day realizing I am lost without him and I need to stay humble. So I don't get saved humbly and then get prideful in my religiosity. I stay humble. I stay putting my faith in him and he continues to pour his grace out on me every day that I live. Now I I open with that thought to say this, God has given the church, given us ways to tangibly experience the grace of God every day, to tangibly experience this grace of God that's being poured out, and to exercise our faith and to to live this thing out. He's given us ways. He's given us multiple ways. But today and next week, I want to talk about two specific ways that God has given us to tangibly experience live this faith out and experience the grace of God, not only naturally, but supernaturally. And it's in two primary things that we call in in traditional church and throughout history, the church has called sacraments. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Today, we're going to talk about one sacrament. Next week, we're going to talk about the second sacrament. And these two things that we're going to talk about are baptism and communion. Baptism and communion. These are Sacraments. The word sacrament simply means sacred mystery. Uh, uh, it's a sacred mystery. There's something that we do physically that is, has a mysterious element to it. It has a powerful element to it as we participate in what Christ has commanded us to do. We get to put action to our faith and experience the grace of God in a supernatural way. And so these sacraments, baptism and communion, are two main sacraments of the church that we, and we here at Love Church, participate in and we uh, make a high priority continually until the end of time. These sacraments are tangible uh, actions that allow us to experience the grace of God and grow in it. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, Paul says this to the Corinthian church. Talking about communion, one of these sacraments, he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, watch this, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? This bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? He's talking about one of the sacraments and he uses the word twice, participation in. Notice this word, participation in. That this salvation follow me, is not just something that we believe in our head or believe in our heart one time. I, I believe in my heart that Jesus is my Savior. Yes, we do believe in our heart that Jesus is our Savior, but then we participate. We are in this faith. We are in that we, we are living out this faith. We are feeling it. We're touching it. It's tangible. I've used the word in this collection. It's earthy. It's authentic. It's raw. It's something that we can experience. And Paul, when talking about one of these sacraments, it's, he's saying you are participating in Christ's death and his resurrection, his blood, his body. You're participating in it. And so it's not just I believe it in my heart. It's, it takes over my hands. It takes over my feet. It takes over my entire being. This outward physical experience um, is symbolic and representative of something that's happening on the inside. God has provided tangible experiences so that we can have assurance of his intangible grace. Sacraments are outward signs of inward grace. They're physical signs of spiritual grace. God doesn't want us to be wondering um, if, if 
we are living in his grace. He wants us to have something to grab a hold of. He wants us, he wants us to taste and see that the Lord is good. And so when we're talking about baptism, when we're talking about communion, we're talking about actions that we can take to participate in the grace of God, all right? Are you following me? This is, this is a little bit of teaching to let you know, like, why do we do baptism? Why do we do communion? Why do we do these things? They are, they are us. Remember, faith and works are tightly connected. It's us being able to do a physical action that, that represents the inward spiritual reality that has happened that otherwise we can't really see. And so it's, it's a gift that God has given us, and it's a gift that God has given his church that we get to um, participate in. And the mysterious part about it is that when we do these things, the Holy Spirit is intensely involved in those experiences, in both baptism and communion. We'll talk more about that over these next two weeks. So today, let's talk about baptism. Baptism. If you want to live a life of faith, you need to understand baptism. This is a big, 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 big deal. Um, If we want to live out our faith, it starts by being baptized. Baptism is a huge deal, and so I want to teach us about it, and then I I I want to give us a call to action. If you're here today and you've already been baptized, here's my prayer. My prayer is that what you have done, this action that you have taken, that you have a deeper understanding of what you've done, that you'll have a deeper reverence for this action of baptism. My, my prayer, if you've already been baptized, is that after today, you'll have a greater passion to see your friends baptized, that you'll have greater passion to see those that are in your small group and in your circle of influence baptized. We as a church need to have a culture, and I pray that today strengthen our culture, a culture of if you believe, you're baptized. The baptism is something that we do. And so if you've got a friend, if you've got a family member, if you've led somebody to Christ, if you have someone in your small group, if you have someone that sits next to you in church, come on, we need to have a culture, a deepened understanding, a passion for baptism. And that's why we're going to talk about this. And then the call, obviously, if you haven't been baptized, the call is going, the call to action today is going to be to get baptized. So let's talk about it. All right. So the first scripture I want to go to is Mark Chapter 16, verse 16, Mark 16, 16, where Jesus specifically and explicitly teaches baptism. He says this, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. All right, this verse you might have heard before. It's very simple, very straightforward, but I want to break it down a little bit and, 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 and be taught. Uh, what Jesus is saying in a deeper way. Anyone who believes, that's our faith, and is baptized, there's an action associated with our faith, Jesus says, will be saved. He ties baptism to believing. Jesus assumes baptism for those who believe. It is explicit. It is plain. It is there right before us. Now, the reason that that I start with this verse is because I think If we're not careful in following the teaching of Jesus and understanding Scripture, we can, and if we're not led and taught, we can see baptism, or Christians could see baptism as something that's optional. Um, But baptism, according to Jesus, is not optional. Baptism is assumed by Jesus. In fact, it is tied together with belief as necessary for salvation. Okay? And I'm going to. But but hang with me for a minute. So Jesus says, if you believe and be baptized, you'll be saved. He doesn't say if you believe, you'll be saved. He says, if you believe and be baptized, you'll be saved. But then he also says, but anyone who doesn't believe will be condemned. He doesn't say anyone who doesn't get baptized will be condemned. He says anyone who doesn't believe will be condemned. And what Jesus is showing us is that when you believe, you get baptized. If you don't believe, you'll be condemned. I think the thief on the cross shows us an example of the fact that Jesus is not saying that you have to be water. If you're not water baptized, you'll be condemned. If you, if you believe in Jesus, but you're not water baptized, you'll be condemned. We can see the thief on the cross who put his faith in Jesus in the last moments of his life. And Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise. There is a salvation. Salvation comes the moment that you believe. So we can, we, we can look at scripture and, and build our theology around the 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 fact that when you believe, you're saved, okay? But we're not the thief on the cross. 
If you're breathing right now and you're still living right now and you believe, Jesus says you believe and you are baptized, that's what saves you. There is a, a, such a tight connection between baptism and belief that Jesus puts them together when talking about salvation. Are you, are you with me? So anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But then anyone who doesn't believe will be condemned. But there's an assumption with belief that baptism comes. All right, then... Second verse I want to go to is Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Jesus models baptism at the start of his ministry. So he teaches baptism, and he models baptism. On the day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, this is Mark 1, beginning of his ministry, um, John baptized him in the Jordan River. And as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. What a, what a mystery here, everyone. What a mystery that Jesus, who never committed a sin, would get baptized. That's, that's, that's something that is, uh, it, it's, it's, it's mysterious. It's, it's, we have to live in, in the tension of what in the world is Jesus getting baptized for if baptism is symbolic of us being forgiven of our sin. Obviously, Jesus never sinned. Uh, he never committed a sin. He was, he was completely spotless and perfect. And so it, it can only, what do you do with this, that Jesus got baptized? What do you do with that? All it can do is deepen our passion and our understanding and deepen the importance of baptism for us as believers. We take away from this that Jesus led the way. Jesus models for us what he wants us to do. Obviously, Jesus didn't need to be forgiven of sin, but he's leading the way. He's going first. He's, he's the firstborn among many. Jesus is going to uh, not only be baptized, but he's going to die and he's going to rise. And luckily, we don't have to die on the cross. But as we'll talk about in a minute, we are crucified with Christ. Our old selves are crucified with him. And as he is raised, we are raised spiritually. And so Jesus goes before us in his whole life as the first. He goes before us as the one that we can follow. And so knowing that he's calling us to follow him, he's baptized. And if we want to follow Jesus, if we want to follow him into heaven, you know, we have to follow him in the waters of baptism. We have to follow him in the things that he did. So not only does he teach it, he models it. And by the way, when he's baptized, the heavens open, the Holy Spirit descends. We see that supernatural mystery. We see the Spirit of God um, um, highly involved in a tangible experience. Baptism is not only symbolic. It's not only representative. It is symbolic. It is representative of what God's done. But it's not only symbolic. It's not only representative. It's not only tangible. There is an intangible, supernatural experience in the waters of baptism. And you might have experienced that before. You might have seen that it happen before as you watch other people be baptized. The Holy Spirit is active in moments of baptism, and we see that when Jesus. So Jesus teaches it, he models it, and then he commands us to baptize. He commands us. He, at Love Church, we have a command because we believe in Jesus. We have a command from him to baptize people. As Christians, we have a command to, to baptize those that are being made um, disciples. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, you've heard this, but let's read. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Let's make followers of Jesus. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which is, by the way, why we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I'm with you always even to the end of the age. He says, make disciples. Don't make people who are nominal Christians. Don't make people who just say, I'm Christian. Don't make people who raise a hand and pray a prayer and just think that everything's, you know, going to be different just because I did that. No, make people who are disciples. They are following Christ. Make people who are going to follow me, obey my commands, follow my teaching, and baptize them. This, this, is, this is what you do when you are saved, is you are baptized. And so um, he's, he not only teaches that anyone who believes will be baptized, um, but, he, but he models it, and then he commands us to baptize people. Now, I want to talk about the water aspect of water baptism. I want to talk about the symbolism a little bit. Why are we 
baptized in water? Why are we immersed in water? What is that about? And this will deepen our understanding of baptism. Water throughout Scripture, so, so go, going back to the Old Testament, water is a sign of salvation. Water is tightly connected with God saving us, God cleansing us of sin. Uh, in the Old Testament, water was connected to the saving of God's people out of bondage. And, now, and, and you can, in the New Testament, we have Peter and Paul referencing stories in the Old Testament of how water was a part of the, sal- of, of the saving of God's people or the cleansing of wickedness. Peter references it when he talks about Noah, Noah's ark, when Noah builds the ark. Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 20, only he's talking about... Noah building the ark and his family getting on the ark, and he says only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. When the flood wiped out the entire earth, only eight people were saved, and it was Noah and his family. And he says in verse 21, that water, this is Peter, is a picture of baptism, which now saves you. And this water is not by the removing of dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. And it's effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Christ has gone to heaven. He's seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and, and powers accept his authority. The water washed away the wickedness in the earth. It it destroyed wickedness, and Noah was chosen. Noah's family were seen as righteous, and they were chosen as the ones that would be saved. And so they on that ark are sustained as the water wipes away the wickedness, and then the earth basically starts over. And that was God using water to wash away wickedness, and Peter draws the, the connection between Noah and the flood and our salvation and our being baptized in water. Then Paul does the same thing. First Corinthians 10, he says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them. And he's talking about the Israelites. And all of them walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. Remember what happens. The Israelites go into the parted Red Sea being chased by their enemies. They go through the sea. The enemies follow them through the sea. The waters crash onto the Egyptians, and the people of God are now on the other side of the sea with the enemy no longer chasing them. Like they come to the other end of the water, and they're delivered from the enemy. And, and, and Paul uses the term baptized. They were baptized as they go through the sea. Again, water is a part of the saving of God's people, the washing away of wickedness. And by the way, I love that picture because as they're being pursued by the enemy, they're being pursued by evil. They go through water and then the enemy is washed away. And when Peter uses the word in the verse we just read, when Peter uses the word that we are baptized and we're baptized into a clean conscience, he says. It's a response to God for a clean conscience. I love the, the, the picture there, especially when you look at how the Israelites were baptized out of the, being delivered from their enemies. Because as Christians, I believe in God, I'm forgiven of my sin. But there is a supernatural experience that happens in baptism. That as I go into the water, it's my sin being washed away. And I come up with a restored conscience. I come up with the power of the enemy, the power of the, the things that once held me back being broken. I still have to walk that out. I still have to live out my freedom. But there is a supernatural breaking of power that happens in the waters of baptism. And if there wasn't, Jesus wouldn't be commanding us to do it. He's not commanding us to do it to be cute. He's commanding us to do it because there is power in the saving of sin, and there's power in the symbolism of the water washing away the wickedness and cleansing our conscience and getting the enemy, you know, loosing the power of the enemy getting the enemy off my back. And he's still going to try and he's still going to attempt and he's still going to be at war with us. But there is a level of power that he no longer has when I believe and I'm baptized. 
It's death to sin. It's a new birth into righteousness. It's leaving Egypt behind us, entering into the promised land of our lives. It's, it's letting God wash away the wickedness of our lives with the, the flood of water that we enter into when we enter into baptism. Come on, it's powerful. It's powerful. Water was involved in the saving of God's people throughout the Old Testament. Water was involved when you were born naturally. And Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3 that you not only need to be born the first time, but you need to be born again. And water is involved when you're born a second time spiritually. Water is involved in the saving of God's people. It is involved in the natural birth of you. And water is involved again in your rebirth into a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's the power of water. Water gives us the physical experience on the outside of what God has done and is doing on the inside. And the Holy Spirit is all up in the experience, doing a work on the inside that's mirroring what's happening on the outside. It's powerful. Paul says in Galatians, I want to go to Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. Paul says, for you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Again, he's, he's talking about something we're physically experiencing this. And the physical experience of baptism is mirroring the spiritual experience that's happening. It's like we're taking off the old and we're putting on the new. We are putting on Christ when we get baptized. When this is, it's so significant, it's so rich, it's so powerful that this, this experience of baptism, I'm getting rid of the sin and I'm putting on Christ. He says, it's like you're putting on new clothes, putting on the new jersey. We've talked about that before in teaching baptism. It's like you're taking off the old jersey, you're joining a new team. I'm joining the team of Christ. I'm joining the church of Christ. I'm, I'm joining Christ's body. I'm putting on a new jersey. I'm switching teams. The commanders have me wanting to switch teams right now because just, they're just awful. <laughs> but I'm going to stick with it. But we're, we're, we're joining a new team. We're putting on new clothes. Paul says to the Romans in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, I'm giving you this scripture because I'm wanting to give, I'm wanting to teach you today. I'm wanting to deepen our understanding of baptism today. He says, well, then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we may also live new lives. Listen, what Paul is telling them is, listen, you get to experience this. What you believe about Christ, you get to experience it in baptism. Because when you go into the waters, you are physically, tangibly experiencing the death of Christ. And as you come up, it is a physical, tangible experience of the resurrection of Christ. And it's, and it's a, an experience that's mirroring what has happened to you spiritually, and there's power in it. We're not going to keep on sinning so that grace can abound, because we have been baptized. And if you haven't been baptized, this is the call. You need to be baptized so that the sin can be put to death, that the sinful nature can be put to death in your life. And as you go in the water, I'm joining with Christ. It's not just representative, I'll say it again. It's not just symbolic. It's not typology. It's not only that. It's actually what Jesus wanted us to do physically. He wants us to experience physically what is happening to us spiritually, and it's the gift. It's the sacrament of baptism. So what do we do? What do we do with it? We've been talking about it. What do we do with this truth? What, do, what, what am I preaching us into? What am I teaching us into? I'll, I'll, Preaching and teaching should lead us to do something. What do we do? The call is to get baptized. The call is to get the the, the call is if you've already been baptized and and you knew what it meant and and that was a powerful experience for you, the call is to let that deepen your understanding, to let that deepen your appreciation, to to help you help others, as we talked about. But the call is if you haven't been baptized, or maybe you're baptized as a kid, you know, or maybe you're baptized in You walked away from God and came back, or you recommitted, and and it would mean something new. There's nothing in the Bible against getting re-baptized. You don't have to get re-baptized every time you sin, to be clear. But but it but there there is there can be power in getting baptized again if the the 
the, the circumstances of your life have, have led you to a point now where you feel like it would be representative of something. So whether you've never been baptized, you need to be baptized, or whether you got, maybe you got baptized as a child and you want to get baptized again, the call is to get baptized. That, that's, that's the call. But two things are needed in order to get baptized. It's not just baptism alone. It's two things. The first is repentance, and the second is, is faith. And these two things are tightly tied together because to put our faith in Jesus means to turn to him and trust him with our life. But to do that, it causes me to have to turn from my sinful life, trusting in myself and pride and thinking that I know better. And so it's repentance that's turning. It's turning away from sin, changing my mind about who I trust, and it's putting my faith in God. Repentance and faith is the, the precursor for baptism. It's, it's I believe and I'm baptized. So repentance and faith are the things necessary to be baptized. I want to show you this. I'll close with this passage. Um, but when we look at the early church, we see mass baptisms happening. We see, we see baptisms happening all over the thousands of people baptized in one day, in fact, at the launch of the church, the, the first church, the early church in Acts chapter 2. And we see very clearly repentance and faith leading to baptism. I want to read this. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. The pe- people of Israel, listen. This is, this is Peter talking. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing miracles wonders and signs through him, as you know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. And with the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. Peter's not mincing words. He's preaching on this day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit's poured out. He's preaching to everybody. He's letting them, he's making sense of the gospel. He's preaching the gospel. He's letting them know what Jesus has done. And as he's preaching this, he's telling them, you're sinful. You nailed him to the cross. And they literally did. But you need to know everybody. I know it sounds harsh, but you nailed him to the cross too. I nailed Jesus to the cross with my sin. It's my sin that, that, G, that led Jesus to the cross because he wanted to take my sin instead of me. He's decided to hang on the cross instead of me. And you need to understand the words of Peter, the words of Scripture are true for us today. He says, you nailed him to the cross. And, and, and Peter's words hit them. Then they hit them hard. And, and it says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. The gospel, when truly comprehended, you need to know this, it cuts us and then heals us. Good, sound preaching will cut us and then heal us. The, 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 I heard a, a preacher say that good preaching will lead you to hell, but it won't keep you there. It'll let you know that we belong there without the grace of God. And Peter's preaching to them, and he's preaching, turn, repent. This sin is going to kill you, and sin killed Jesus. And so you have an opportunity not to be killed by sin because he was killed for you. But you don't just get the grace of God without believing. You have to turn and put your faith in God. That's what unlocks the grace. And so it's this preaching of turning. It's this call to turn from sin, to repent and put your faith in God. That's the call, and that's our response, and that's what leads us into the waters of baptism. It says that when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And I want you to know today, this is the response of the believer, The response of the believer that's encountered the gospel message of Jesus, that he died and and rose again, and he did that for us. The response of of the authentic response of a believer is, what should I do in response to this? What should I do? The response to the gospel shouldn't be, I believe in my heart, God, and now let me tell you what I'm available for. I, I believe in my heart, let me tell you what I'm willing to do. I believe in my heart, 
I raised my hand. I prayed the prayer. Now let me tell you what I'm available for. Let me tell you what pace I'm ready to go at, Jesus. And, and sometimes as Christians, we allow each other. We allow each other in the church. And we need to repent for this as Christians. We need to repent. I need to repent for this as a leader where we've, as leaders, fallen short and allowed people to think that God will go at your pace. God will work around your desires. God will work around your preferences. No, no, no. The response of a believer isn't, God, uh, I'm in, but I'm going to be in on my terms. The response of a believer is, I'm cut to the heart. Tell me what to do. What should I do next? This is what they're asking. Brothers, what shall we do with this news that we nailed him to the cross? And Peter answers the question, and this is the answer today. This is the call to act. All of today has, is culminating with the command of Peter, because this is the command of heaven. Peter said back to them, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. He doesn't say, you know, just Believe and then wander off in, in, and hope that you can live in this grace. He says, repent, which means turn. Put your faith in God and then be baptized. Tangibly experience this. Go into the waters of baptism. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and all who are fall off far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness, I guess he preached a long message, and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And so those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. The people heard the message. They decided to repent, to turn from their sin, and to be baptized. Baptism is it's saying I'm all in. Like the humility and the, the immersion of baptism physically is representing what you're, you're not saying like, well, I'm, I'm, I guess my, my hair will get wet. Or I was planning on going to lunch, you know, and I, so I don't want to get wet before lunch. Or I don't want to get my clothes wet. Or I don't want to look stupid in front of people. Or that's going to be embarrassing if everybody's looking at me. That's not the response of a believer. The response of someone that's been cut to the soul with the good news of the gospel says, God, what do you want me to do? And God doesn't mince words. And scripture is clear over and over. And Jesus himself Red letters tells us that you need to believe and be baptized. This is our, this is our, our action. This is our tangible action to show the faith that is in our heart. And that's the call to you today. It's the call to our church is to repent and be baptized. Repent and be back. If you've been baptized, this will deepen our understanding. This will help us have more passion for this sacrament of the church, for, for what God has given us to put tangible actions to this intangible spiritual reality that's happened in our life. But if you haven't been baptized, if, if you were baptized before, but it doesn't mean anything to you anymore, listen to me. The, the call is repent, turn to God, and be baptized. It's that clear. It's that simple. And it's that strong. He says, every one of you. So everybody watching today, if you're watching live with us this Sunday morning, if you're watching it back, the call is repent, turn from your sin, abandon your pride, abandon thinking that you know better than God, turn to God, humble yourself before him, put your faith in him, and the immediate initial action should be, I'm, I'm going to be baptized, every one of you. And so, this is what I want to tell you, I want to get practical, and we're going to pray, and we're going to pray pr prayer of repentance before God, a prayer of I'm all in God. But then our prayer is backed up with our action of baptism. But let me give you a practical next step now for those of you watching. And I want to talk to a couple different groups of people, whether you're watching it live or online. Listen, if you are close enough to come to one of our physical locations in Gainesville or in Winchester, you're going to sign up. You're going to, I'm telling you in faith, you're going to, I'm have the faith of Peter, the boldness of Peter. Every one of you are going to go to our website at welovechurch.com slash baptism, and we'll put it on the screen, and you're going to sign up to be baptized in person. We're baptizing people today, by the way. This is Baptism Sunday at our church. We're baptizing people today. But what we've done is our team has put together because of this weekend's message, we've put together another baptism 
two weeks from today, and we're going to be baptizing people again so that you can respond to this message. And if you are anywhere near being able to get to a physical location, the call is going to be to go online and sign up and be baptized at our next baptisms to say, I repent, I turn from sin, and I want to show that. I want to live that. I want to put tangible action to that by getting baptized. That's the call today. And so you might, you might be a couple hours away. I'm telling you, you need to the urgency of Peter is the urgency that I feel from the Holy Spirit to call our church to get baptized. You need to have some urgencies. I'm going to get there. But now to another group of people who might physically not be able to, we have your back as well. And we want to come alongside you and help you to get baptized. And so when you go to our website, welovechurch.com slash baptism, there's an option for you to say at home or remote baptism. And we want to come alongside of you. We want to get in touch with you and help you get baptized wherever you are. We want to talk you through the options that you have. We want to get you connected to a people, a church, or an environment where you can get baptized right where you are because you don't have to be at our church to get baptized. You might be watching this a year later, watching it back in an archive. Sign up. We're going to get in touch with you in real time and let you know and help you to get baptized. Your life and your faith is too important. It's too, your, the, the stakes are too high right? You need to be baptized. You need to live in the reality of my old, the old is gone, and I've been washed clean by the Spirit of God, by grace, through faith. You need to, it's too big of a deal for you to not do it, and the call is wherever you are, whether you can get here in person or whether we're going to connect with you and make it happen where you are, the call is repent and be baptized. And, and I close with the last thing he says is, to them is save yourselves from this crooked generation. The, the call is be saved from it. And, and I just think it's not necessarily flashy. It's not necessarily something that, that is, is feel good. But not all the time are the best things in our life, do they feel good. Sometimes the best things in our life don't feel good right now. And Peter's call to them is save yourselves from this crooked generation. Like, you are in need of salvation. You, you're going to die if you don't do this. And, and I just feel like prophetically, that, that's leading up into this weekend, I've been talking to our team about this. I feel prophetically that we need to, as, as far as my influence can go, so whoever's listening, listen, we need to be saved from sin. We need to be saved from sin. I know a lot of you are. You're saved already from sin. But if you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized because that's a part of the salvation process. That's part, of, that's part of the package. You need to know that. And so the call is save yourself. The, the sin that's in the world, the evil that's in the world, the enemy is, he always has been, but he's on the prowl. He's, he's, he's strategizing. He's He's chasing. He's, it's like we're chased by sin, like the Israelites were chased by the Egyptians. And baptism is a part of breaking free from that sin. And this is a moment, everybody, where in, in society and in culture, where we live especially, like in, in, the, in the Western church, in the United States, the church, this is our moment to rise up. This is, our, this is a moment to rise up and to be the light in the darkness. But but we can't be playing with darkness. We can't be half in and half out. This is, this is not a moment for half in, half out. This is a moment for I'm all in. Nothing better than baptism to, to symbolize I'm all in. Nothing better than baptism to put action to I'm all in. I'm all in. Put me in the water of baptism. Wash that sin away. Give me a clean conscience, God. Holy Spirit, come on to me in these waters of baptism as I come up clean. And let's be a church that's all in, saving ourselves from the crookedness of the generation and able to save others as well which is the call, go into the world and baptize people. So let's pray, and then you are going to sign up and get baptized. All right, everybody? That's what's going to happen. Let's pray, and then when, when this finishes, you're going to sign up and get baptized. So God, we thank you for your saving grace. We started today by talking about the fact that we're saved by grace through faith, not by anything that we've done. We thank you that you went to the cross before we did anything. While we were still sinners, Christ died. You made the initial step. You initiated. You, you made a way where there was no way. And 
And we respond to that today in gratitude, overwhelmed by your amazing grace, going and paying the price, going and taking our place on the cross. We're overwhelmed by it. And our response is repentance. Our response is we turn and we, we lay ourselves at your feet. We, we pour ourselves out before you. We give our lives to you. And, and Jesus, you've instructed us that we can, we can act that out. We can physically, tangibly experience that through baptism. But it starts with our heart repenting and turning towards you. So we do repent. God, God collectively right now, like it, corporately right now, each one of us, we've already repented for sin and we're saved. Great. But we continue in a posture of repentance, a posture of uh, humility and, and being contrite before you, understanding our, our brokenness. And and for those that are watching that have never repented, turn from sin and put their faith in you, they're going to do that right now. We, we, put, we repent, we turn to you, we put our trust in you and you alone. We put our faith in you and you alone. And that's where it starts. We thank you for what you've done for us. We give our lives to you. We lay aside every sin that holds us back. We lay aside anything that we've trusted in, any idol, we lay it down, and we put our faith in you today. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory because you are good and you deserve it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody.